Easter Sunday, 1945. In our churches that day, there was a new note of hope. The combined weight of Allied arms was crushing Nazi Germany under the wall of its own fortress Europe. And it seemed that one war, at least, was almost over. But half a world away, off the Pacific island of Okinawa, Easter Sunday was D-Day to the soldiers and marines of the 10th Army. Okinawa was only 400 miles from Japan, and waiting to defend it, we knew it would be 100,000 Japanese soldiers. But more than that, there would be almost 500,000 civilians who might well become the biggest moral and military responsibility yet encountered in the Pacific. So, voted with the assault troops for special civil affairs teams, 840 officers and men of the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps, whose job it would be to collect all civilians, establish military government over them, and prevent their interfering with our operation. Marines of the 3rd Amphibious Corps made their landing comparatively unopposed. The Japanese had pulled their old trick of giving us a beachhead while they withdrew to prepared inland positions. The civil affairs teams got to work as soon as their waves hit the beach. Their military mission was to secure the civilian population of Okinawa. Driven brutally from their homes by the Japanese, the people literally came out of the ground. A few at first, then whole families, communities. They'd been living for weeks in caves and burrows. They were starving and sick, dazed and shocked from exposure and bombardment and fear. Fear of us, for they believed that their men would be murdered and their women turned over to our troops. That their children and their aged would be shipped to San Francisco to be ground up into dog meat. So they had been told by the Japanese army. And at first they had believed it. But somehow they heard of the fair treatment received by the first few who knew better or feared less. When they discovered that our civil affairs units were not designed for rape, torture or slaughter, so many gave themselves up that by D-Day plus three, we had over 6,000 in custody in the Marine Corps area alone. And six days later, 31,000. Military government had started to function with the finding of the first civilian. Its highly specialized personnel was first concerned with getting the Okinawans safely out of the Japanese perimeter and preventing them from confusing the fire and advance of our expanding beachhead. An entire population equivalent to that of the state of Vermont, had to be rescued from the impact and shock of a battle that was never more than a few thousand yards away. At first, there was no way of knowing how many of these people were yet uncollected. It was known, however, that over 100,000 of the younger and healthier men had been evacuated to Japan just prior to our invasion. It was also known that most of the younger Okinawan women had been forced to accompany the Japanese garrison when it withdrew to the hills. This girl refused to go with them. They cut off her foot and left her alone to starve. The rest of the population had been ordered into the hills with 30 days rations and commanded to kill themselves rather than submit to capture by the Americans. But they preferred to live. So much so that in 25 days, our civil affairs sections had accumulated 150,000 the vanguard of what would eventually be the largest number of enemy civilians yet captured in the Pacific. Civil affairs encouraged the people to bring as much extra food and clothing as they could salvage. For while we were prepared to meet all cases of distress, their capture did not automatically make them American citizens as some believed. And we did not make the landing for the purpose of philanthropy. The Okinawans are of a mixed and mysterious racial origin. And although they are legally Japanese nationals, they displayed no surface hostility. Nevertheless, one woman was caught with hand grenades concealed under her dress. And some were found smuggling food to bypass Japanese soldiers. They may have been merely innocent bystanders of battle, as they claimed. 
but they were kept under constant observation and moved quickly from the zone of military installations. Central collection stations, interrogation facilities were established. Here intelligence personnel from civil affairs screened all adult Okinawans for military information. Means of identification was issued to ensure safe conduct within prescribed zones to those who were considered reliable. But civilian clothes might be a convenient disguise for Japanese soldiers assigned to espionage, sabotage, or assassination behind our lines. Civil affairs had to be watchful for military security is the primary purpose of military government. That and humanity is the basis of our beachhead law. For both these reasons, public health had to be safeguarded. Army and Navy doctors were quick to search out and isolate any contagious disease that might menace our troops with epidemic. For many, this was the first medical treatment they had ever received, for the Japanese had maintained only three doctors for every 10,000 Okinawans. In our country, the ratio is 40 for 10,000. Thousands answered sick call daily for treatment of chronic diseases. But 80% of all immediate hospitalization was for wounds suffered on the fringe of combat. The Japanese had further complicated the health problem before they retreated by releasing a large colony of lepers to wander helplessly around the island. From the collection centers, the civil population was evacuated to villages where they would not hinder our military movement. Here at morning muster, all able-bodied men reported to the civil affairs officer in charge for daily instructions and assignments. They were organized into groups with leaders appointed from among themselves and under our supervision, they helped to govern themselves. They kept daily census, reported their sick, distributed their own food, and aided in the allotment of housing. Their headmen explained and helped enforce our proclamations, such as this one forbidding loitering near military installations. They were not being pampered, but in return for a little dignity, they relieved us of many of the minor problems of nursemaiding over 300,000 civilians. Invaluable aid was offered by a handful of professional people, teachers, doctors, and nurses, like these girls, some of whom had lived in Hawaii. They knew and respected Americans and voluntarily guided their people toward understanding and cooperation. Law is inseparable from order, and to maintain order, all government buildings were sealed by proclamation, impounding for examination all documents which might be of value to our intelligence section. In these buildings were village records and tax rolls which would aid in restoring confiscated property when military expediency would permit, so that no man could say he was denied justice by his new government. With a total population 15 times more dense than that of the United States, the food problem was acute. A strict system of rationing had to be established with a daily food allowance issued to heads of families from a community ration dump. A monetary system was not established while the fighting was still going on, but a record was kept of all rations issued for a future accounting. The food itself was diverted from captured Japanese army stores. And with the exception of special medical rations for infants, invalids, and the critically undernourished, the people could eat only what was on the island when we came so that no supplies were diverted from our troops for civilian use. They would have to get along on a diet of rice, tea, barley, and dried fish until their farms were clear of the combat zone and they could return to salvage their crops.
miles away to the south, the campaign that had started with a wade-in landing had developed into a frontal head-on assault against a stubborn rat hole ridge-by-ridge -ridge defense system. The Japanese artillery was heavier and more accurate than any we had yet encountered. From volcanic outcroppings and coral knobs, they controlled most of the high points of observation. They fired from subterranean fortresses, maneuvered through tunnels and galleries. Often they were behind us. There was no front. We fought them where we found them. We measured our progress in feet and inches against a crafty and fanatical enemy, an enemy we could not see. By the expanding perimeter, the number of our military wards increased daily, and while the artillery still sounded in the distant hills, the people were put to work to provide their own shelter. Supervised by their own headmen, every able-bodied man and woman was detailed to tasks that ran from clearing rubble and crushing tile for a roadbed to corralling horses abandoned by Japanese army officers. Although the Okinawans' medieval traditions had long delegated all menial and manual labor to the women, the civil affairs labor officers saw to it that the men did their full share of the work. <laughs> they grumbled a bit at their loss of dignity, and they were slow, but they worked, and the women approved wholeheartedly. beams and planks for repair and reconstruction, civil affairs put the local sawmill back into operation. Such native industry as had existed before our invasion, like the sugar mill, had also to be re-established if the people were to be self-sufficient. Nothing could be imported, for every cubic foot of incoming cargo space was reserved for the needs of the assault forces. At his headquarters in the field, the Army's Brigadier General Christ, the island commander, discussed daily the problems of military government with his civil affairs staff from all arms of the service. With increasing thousands of civilians being absorbed into our lines, the food situation, always acute, was gradually relieved by the liberation of many farms in the backwash of battle. Civilians were organized into large work parties to harvest the standing crops which had ripened untended in the fields and which would otherwise have rotted on the ground in the imminent rainy season. These are an agricultural people and Okinawa's 920 square miles were virtually all farmland. Everything they grew was food for their own mouths. This harvest was one of the major points in the civil affairs program for self-help and self-support. For the Okinawans were being made to understand that they would not be spoon-fed and could not panhandle their way to freedom. For years, the insatiable commissary of the Japanese army had plundered food from these undernourished people. Now, for the first time, everyone was guaranteed at least a basic oriental diet. Fleet Admiral Nimitz inspected the settlement because the United States Navy had reason to be concerned with the government and welfare of the people. For the Okinawans would be post-war citizens of what will someday be a huge peacetime naval base our westernmost assurance against future aggression from the east. Most of the people gave promise of being cooperative and reliable. 
this Japanese doctor could have escaped to the mainland. Instead, he voluntarily remained so that he could continue to minister to his people. Maybe people like this were sincere, but we took no chances. Anyway, it was the children of Okinawa that mattered most, and our civil affairs sections realized that candy and kind words, medicine and education and recreation, would make them more helpful and useful neighbors to a naval base than their broken-spirited parents. These children were an investment in the future security of an American outpost. But the security of the moment still lay in the course of a battle that raged only a few miles from the laughing children of Okinawa. A battle that had slowly, painfully put four-fifths of the island behind our lines. The Japanese garrison was doomed. And defiant. It was fighting from its last ditch. Naha, Shuri Castle, Yonabaro, Sugarloaf Hill, the Asado Mudflats, Oroko Peninsula. A suicide line that ran all the way across the island. For one bit a month, we battered at that line. Then we cut it into sections, broke it into pockets, pushed the pieces before us toward the sea. We pounded and blasted and burned and swept up the remnants with a broom of fire and a bloody mop. and four months to reach Okinawa and 82 days more of dying to secure the last American battlefield of the Second World War. We won. We paid. But we brought not only death to Okinawa, we brought life to a people whose only crime was to be born slaves. We brought life and hope the right to work and enjoy the fruits of their labor. To laugh and to play. But our job is not done. A just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Just as the cost of war was high, so peace does not come at bargain prices. Seven issues of war bonds help to put these men in Tokyo. And one victory loan can finish the job and bring them back. The bonds you buy can bind up wounds, build up cities, and buy tickets home for these boys. They're still doing their job. It's up to you to keep on doing yours. Buy victory bonds now and attain our next objective, security.